next week. Yeah, I'm doing next week. That's next week. Yeah, there's a flip side is this week. Good morning. Welcome to worship today. It's good to see everyone here. Um, yeah, remember to fill out your connection point card and uh, uh, just keep so we can keep track of everyone. And uh, um, really, the numbers are uh, you know for our own local help, but also because the Senate likes to uh, um, to know uh, across the you know the board how many people are worshiping uh, every Sunday and how many people are communing and you know so. Uh, um, they're the one that's interested in all the statistics, but that's why we just keep them for our local, uh, our local purposes, too. So, uh, all right, um, why don't we uh, stand up and greet folks around us as we prepare for worship this morning? As we're moving through this month again, we're continuing singing catechism hymns, uh, and so today one of ours is the is the confession absolution hymn that will be our opening hymn today as a uh, chief of sinners though I be.
Action, please rise as you're able, as we begin our service with confession and absolution. We begin our service now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are clear. Since we are gathered to hear God's word and to call upon him in prayer and praise and the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and to one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father and holy baptism, you declared us to be your children, and you gathered us into your one holy church, into which you daily and richly forgive our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through our, your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. We'll continue with our hymn of praise. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray, and always ready to give more than we either desire or deserve. Pour down on us the abundance of your mercy, forgive us those things of which our conscience is afraid, and give us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except for the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our readings. Good morning. Good morning. Our Old Testament lesson is taken from chapter 4 of the book of Genesis. Now Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? 
If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is taken from the 12th chapter of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the beginning of a month. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire. With unleavened bread and herbs, they shall eat it. Do not eat it, any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted with its, with its, head, with its, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that rain remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day, you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day, a holy assembly. No work shall be done on those days, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you, and you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day, I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever, in the first month, from the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner 
or a native of the land, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places, you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he seeds the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so, as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So they did. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. <laughs> Please rise as you're able according uh, for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory to you. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. <clears throat> Two men went up into the temple to pray one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get, but the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now they were bringing even the infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them to him, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated for our next song. <coughs>
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord my God. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So, of course, we're continuing our study, our sermon series, What Does This Mean? Um, uh, we've been digging through the chief parts of the Christian faith. So last week we talked about confession, absolution, and office of the keys. And today we're going to talk about Holy Communion. And then uh, actually next week, we'll uh, be talking about um, the last section of the catechism that's titled Christian Questions with Their Answers. And uh, I've, the, the, the theme for next week is church and state, because that's a wonderful uh, hot button topic. So it'll be a great way to uh, uh, celebrate Reformation. So Passover is uh, uh, what we're, we're looking at today. And if you want to follow along in your pew Bible, it's page uh, 48, Exodus chapter 12, page 48 in your pew Bible. Um, we're looking at the Passover meal uh, that was celebrated. Um, so up until this point, just kind of, you know, get us oriented to where we are in, in this text. Up until this point, God had performed nine uh, different plagues on the Egyptians. And uh, each time, you know, he was differentiating between the Israelites community and the Egyptians. So the community, the Israelites lived in a kind of a, 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 a neighboring town that butted up against Egypt. And anyway, and so uh, um, it was then uh, right after the 10th and final plague that the Israelites then would, of course, leave uh, Egypt. And um, so that's why this reading, it was a little longer today, but it was also just a reminder of, uh, you know, kind of how serious and how important this is to God, okay? Because the Israelites were going to, before the 10th and final plague happened, God was going to, uh, one of the Israelites to prepare and to get some food and drink in their belly because they were going to head out on a night journey to leave Egypt after being slaves for generations, about, about 400 years in Egypt. And, uh, and so they were going to prepare this meal and eat it, and then uh, they were going to go to bed, and then the destroyer would come through all of the land, and he would destroy. Uh, so, um, and I can't remember if I have any slides on this, so forgive me here. Um, I don't. Hey, okay. Good to know then. That makes it all easier. Exodus 12. So let's read these first couple of verses, though, in here. Exodus chapter 12. Um, then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron um, in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of, of, of your year. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb and for his family, one for each household. If each, let's see, uh, and then let's jump down to verse 8. Um, verse 8, that same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or cooked in water, but roasted over the fire, head, legs, and inner parts. Do not leave any of it until morning. If someone is left until the morning, you must burn it up. This is how you're to eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand. Eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. All right, so this was kind of like the first uh, um, fast food sort of recorded in the scriptures. What? What? Hey, can you, it's Rosie. Rosie, come on. What are you doing? All right. So this is kind of the first recorded uh, uh, time where we see kind of fast food. God wanted the Israelites to prepare a lamb, have some flat bread, and then we talked this 
about unleavened uh, leavening, um, and it probably was more like a like a sourdough starter is probably what it was. Okay, they didn't have those little instant yeast packets that they store these days. Okay, um, but the idea was they were going to get rid of the leavening, and uh, we'll talk about that in a bit. But there, God preparing the Israelites, this is what your supper is going to be, a lamb, you're going to have flatbread and bitter herbs and some other vegetables with it, and uh, you need to, you know, prepare it according to uh, how many people are in your family, you know, how many, you do that when you prepare a turkey, right? You think, how many visitors are coming, and then we need to prepare a turkey based on that, and so that's kind of what we're doing here, is the amount of people that are going to be eating the lamb, and of course he gives directions here, um, not eating a boil, uh, but roasting it, and then uh, they're supposed to eat, eat as much of it they're able. If there's anything left over in the morning, they're supposed to burn it up because it has become a sacred kind of special meal because after this meal, they're going to go to bed and then the destroying angel is going to come and he is going to destroy all the houses in the land of Egypt that don't have blood painted on their doors, on their door frames, okay? And that's, of course, what, we're, what, uh, what we see is happening here. Another key point here is uh, uh, this, this blood, which I just said. So look here in verse 5 here in our text. Um, let's see, verse 5. The animal you choose must be a year old uh, uh, males without defect. You may take from them the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month when all the people of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Um, let's see. Then uh, let's see. Uh, let me go on here. A couple more verses. Uh, let's see, then uh, uh, they are to take some of the blood, oh, this is it, put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they are to eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. So um, right here is a, is a beautiful picture of the preparation that God is preparing his people and then ultimately for us. For um, for Christ coming, shedding His blood, because this is this is the uh, this is one of those examples in Scripture where we see how you know God is preparing the Israelites to to prepare this special meal of lamb and you know and and flatbread and and vegetables and what. But then, too, you know, it's, it's, and, and, and there's significance in that. And, and you, I know some of you have talked about, you've heard uh, people, uh, you know, some Jewish communities or whatever will celebrate the Passover meal and, or for Christians so that Christians can understand it. All right. Um, but what we're going to focus on here is really kind of a couple of things of the shed blood, which is the main, main gist going on here, okay? That, that God wants them to paint the door for him with the blood of that lamb. And that, uh, um, uh, and then, of course, we know later, just a little bit later in Scripture, that the destroying angel will come through the towns and see where uh, someone has painted uh, blood from the lamb on the door, and that destroying angel will pass over that house, and he will go on to the next ones. And it's this, you know, of course, it's a true, it's a really a turning point in the lives of the Israelites because. They are, um, you know, at this point, we even see at the very at the beginning, uh, you know, verse chapter, or ver, you know, chapter, verse one, the Lord, uh, or verse, verse two, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your years. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, each one, one for each of his household. And so this is, th this actually marks the, the new calendar year, if you will, for the, for the Israelites, uh, the Passover meal. Um, and, uh, you know, as Vicky was reading it again this morning, and I was, you know, is sometimes it's great when I hear it read. I mean, I can read it and listen to it, but it's great when somebody else reads it to me. And I was, I was thinking it's, you know, at the beginning of this, it's, a, it, you know, this, once they leave Egypt and next year and the following year and every year after that, they're supposed to celebrate this Passover meal, remembering how Jesus, how God saved them out of Egypt Okay, they eat this meal and they eat it with their, you know, you're, you're ready to go on your coat, your shoes, your hat, everything. You're ready to go. Grab your purse. You're going to, you're ready to, you're going to be ready to go. Okay. As God tells them, this is the Lord's Passover because they are preparing to get ready to leave Egypt. Okay. And so I understand modern day Jews that still they still will eat this meal. You know, they will still celebrate it this way by putting on their shoes and socks and getting ready like they're getting ready to get out the door and, and head out. Okay. 
So, but God is, is asking them to, to prepare their, this day. And so this is the beginning of their, their new calendar year, the first week of their calendar year, the first day they have worship. And then at the end of the week, they have worship. We see this a lot actually throughout the Old Testament where, where God is instituting uh, different uh, uh, holidays and events uh, where they, you know, they do this, of course. We have a worship service at the beginning of the, of the Passover week. It becomes later known as the Feast of, of, of Unleavened Bread. That's not very, maybe a very catchy title, but I mean, you know, it's what they have. So, uh, and so they, they begin their, their, their Feast of Unleavened Bread by worshiping, and then they end, they wrap up their, or their week of, of worship, uh, or the week of Unleavened Bread with worship. We see how, uh, uh, you know, how important that God is making these things because he, he cares for the Israelites and he has, he has cared for them for generations while they were living in Egypt as slaves. We even see how, you know, King Solomon even kind of talks about how, how much God cares for his people here uh, in First Chronicles, a prayer that King David wrote. There is none like you, O Lord, and there is no God beside you. According to all that we have heard with our ears, and who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making for yourself a name for great and awesome things, driving out nations before your people whom you redeem from Egypt, people Israel to be your people forever, and you, O Lord, became their God. I love that imagery of just a reminder of how God chose the Israelites. Of all the peoples that lived on the planet at the time, God picked the Israelites. They weren't the biggest. They weren't the most uh, powerful. They weren't the most successful. They were, definitely weren't the most you know, well-known. And yet God picked them from all the peoples. Centuries later, Peter describes the same you know, collective group of people we call the church of God, the, the people of God. First Peter chapter two, but you are my chosen race, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. This one thing I love about scripture is how, you know, there, everything ties in together. There's, there aren't any mistakes or accidents or whoops, we forgot that. You know, why'd we stick that chapter in there? And, uh, you know, there are chapters and portions that can seem confusing, but everything was put in the scriptures for a specific purpose and reason and for all, our overall learning so that we can ultimately be reminded of what God has done for us through Jesus's life, death, and sacrificial uh, death and his, uh, over his, his victorious resurrection from the dead. So this Passover meal is not just, you know, God laying out the meal plans, the menu, and, and the, the setting and the situation. Remember, the main point is this shed blood from Christ. I mean, ultimately, the shed blood from the lamb, but the shed blood ultimately... Experiencing. This Passover meal, is, it was to be celebrated every year to remind them, of course, how God brought them out of Egypt, how he saved them for generations, even as slaves in Egypt, brought them out, made them his own people, chose them, and gave them the Ten Commandments and the Word of God so that they would want to be with him, and they would desire to be with him. So we see this here in, uh, uh, in, in our readings here, starting in uh, verse 24. <clears throat> verse 24, observe, observe these instructions as lasting ordinances for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe, observe this ceremony. When your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So here we see that, um, you know, this ordinance and encourage continue to do this for generations. Again, to remind the people of what God had done for them. We see this, of course, centuries later when Jesus, on, on what we you know, now know as Monday, Thursday, when Jesus sat down with his disciples 
and he, uh, um, they were eating the Passover meal that had been set celebrated for centuries before and up until that point. And then we see here, and, and of course in our, our gospel reading, uh, and, well, not our gospel, in Matthew's gospel, 26, Jesus was eating and his disciples were eating. Jesus took bread after ble blessing it. He broke it and gave it to the disciples and said something very radical different that had never been taught or said or spoken before in the uh, Passover meal. Jesus then takes this unleavened bread and he says, take it, this is my body. That would have been really weird immediately because for centuries that's not what they've been taught. I mean, what they've been taught was what was in the Old Testament and, you know, but they never heard this part, okay? No one ever told, no one ever said this part where Jesus, no one ever took the flat bread at the Passover meal and said, take, eat, this is my body. Jesus took the cup. When he given thanks, he gave to them saying, again, another radical thing that was totally different from what they'd been taught for centuries of eating the Passover meal. Drink of it, all of you, this wine, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, all, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So they were eating the Passover meal, celebrating the bread and the wine and the, and the vegetables and all that was there, uh, the, the lamb that was all there. According to the, according what's written here in Exodus, this is what they were eating and enjoying. And then at this point, you know, this is that radical shifting in, uh, in uh, um, the Passover celebratory uh, life um, in which the Israelites were, the Jews now are, are you know, totally like, radical. But think about it. I mean, every time Jesus came on the scene, wasn't he radical? It wasn't, it wasn't like, uh, I mean, he snuck. Sometimes he, he slipped on in and people had no idea he was there. We see this in even John, John chapter 1 where it says that, you know, he came among them and they had no idea who he was. And yet here Jesus now at, at this, this, this Passover meal is, is taking this bread and this wine and he, he's basically focusing now, kind of narrowing down the Passover meal down to this, this kind of the core things to focus again on Christ. The bread we take is the, the body of Christ, and the blood, the, the wine we take, it is the blood of Christ. I mean, that's what we celebrate. We get to celebrate that. We get the opportunity to celebrate every week the, the body and blood of Christ and Holy Communion. And that's what it's become. This is, this is where it's this is the progression of, of where we are. You know, we didn't just one day someone decide, let's, let's have bread and wine and celebrate something like the Passover during Holy Communion, during a worship service. No, it's, this is... This, this, is where, this is where Holy Communion comes from, okay? Our, our Lutheran forefathers didn't just create this out of thin air one day. This is, this is back, in the, and back in the Gospels where Jesus is telling us he's taking the Passover, the bread and the wine, and he's focusing now on, on himself so that we will constantly see Christ. You know, that's why you see some, some you know, I've seen this. Other Christians, other maybe some other church bodies, they will really, you know, kind of, uh, kind of say, adore the uh, the the elements, the bread and the wine, and, and communion, and 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 Jesus never tells us that we should adore them. We should just receive them by faith, because we give this. I, you know, what what happens when we come up here? You come up here and kneel, and what are you expecting? Well, I assume you're expecting to receive the body and blood of Christ, right? I mean. That's why you come up here. Okay, and what are you expecting to receive from that? Well, we receive the forgiveness of sins, the reminder of what Jesus has done for us. This take and eat, this is my body given and shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. Take and drink, this is the cup of my blood which is shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. I receive, you receive Christ's body and blood. I receive it by faith because I know Jesus tells me this. This is body and blood, and I receive this by faith because I know that Jesus isn't going to lie to me or isn't going to tell me something stupid. That doesn't, he doesn't mean. He's going to tell me the truth. And I receive this. So when, when, you know, the elder and I, we receive communion first and, and then, you know, the rest of our congregation and, and so forth, I know that I'm receiving Christ's body and blood. And that's an amazing, almost humbling, kind of, you know, weird thing. But I just take it by faith because that's what Jesus tells me to do. 
And I love that, you know, Jesus at the Passover meal, he just took what they had. It was bread, unleavened flatbread, lambs, wine, vegetables. I mean, there might have been something else, but that was the main gist, okay? I mean, it's food. It's just food that we, we could find that food today. He didn't go and you know, say, well, you're going to need traverse the Himalaya mountains and find some berry picked in some random bush that only grows, you know, in the two weeks in January. And no, he gave us common everyday things, which is wonderful. Flour and water, make some flatbread, make some wine. Where wine come from? Grapes. I love it. You know, there's something basic about it. And then he gives it to us so that we can then receive from Jesus his body and blood. Celebrate Holy Communion. We're reminded then, I mean, this is a kind of a baptismal text in the small but so it's perfectly a reminder of this, that God saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that having been justified by God's grace, just as if I had not sinned, justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. So I pray that today, when we receive communion, every week that you have the opportunity to receive Holy Communion, you can be reminded you're receiving Jesus for you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And that alone should give you comfort and peace and maybe some joy. And uh, real quick, I uh, just reminded of a, a little, uh, when I was at seminary, there was a fourth year guy who was always trying to, there was always, you know, seminarians are trying to buck the system. And this guy was always trying to be crazy and what, but very respectful in service. You know, we had chapel service at the seminary and, uh, and it was a beautiful thing. And I think we had communion once a week um, there. Um, and I just remember he said one time when we were visiting, we were kind of sitting around in our, in our, uh, our lounge and our dorm. And he said uh, um, that, you know, he's like, why is it that we Lutherans? He said, we're really good about this. We come back from communion and we're like this. He's like, we're all sad and bowed down. Like, you know, we just came back from a funeral. <laughs> and I, and I thought that was really kind of funny because I was like, so, of course, the next week I had to make sure and see that I wasn't looking like I'd just come back from a funeral. He's like, because this guy, every time he came back from, he was always smiling and he was always happy. And I thought, you know what, that's the appropriate response. Why? Because he has just received Jesus for the forgiveness of his sins. Anyway, so you don't, you don't have to, you can look however you want, okay? I'm not going to tell you how to look, but just, you know, be aware. You know, when you come back from communion, it, You've just, I often think of this as like, this is greater than a Thanksgiving Day meal. This is greater than a Christmas Day meal. Greater than any, any holiday meal that you can celebrate. And aren't you usually happy? Now, granted, from those, we always come back and we're like, whoa, my belly. Uh, you know, but you're happy, aren't you? Nobody ever gets up from a Thanksgiving belly and say, whoa, my belly, and saying, whoa. Well, maybe because you ate too much, but you're still happy, right? I mean, I am. And that's the way we, Christ gives us of his body and blood so that we can be reminded of what Jesus has done for us. He gives us of himself for you for the forgiveness of your sin so that you can be reminded weekly, if not more often, of what Jesus has done for you. We pray that you'll be reminded by the Holy Spirit of, of what God is doing in your life. We pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds, found in the one true faith of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please rise as you're able as we confess our faith now with the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all the worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified.
identified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and the, the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Be merciful to your church here and in every place. Defend our pastors from arrogance and pride. Strengthen them in the faithful preaching of your word and both your holy law and your precious gospel, that they would be proclaimed and that all of your children will be united in saving faith. We therefore pray for our, our, our national, state, and local uh, uh, church leaders, including Pastor Matt Harrison, our LCMS president, Pastor Alan Buss, our Northern Illinois District president, Pastor Carl Fay, our circuit visitor, and all pastors in our area. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our local church leaders, including the Board of Elders, continue to encourage them to seek you in every problem so that they will be reminded that you have our congregation in your hands. Lord, in your mercy, send your spirit into our hearts, souls, and minds so that we will desire to learn more about you each day by reading or listening to your holy word. Lord, in your mercy, grant that all who come to this holy uh, altar this day would receive the very body and blood of Jesus in repentance and faith to their abundant blessings. Lord, in your mercy, as your son welcomed infants, give us a deep care for the children entrusted to us that we would defend their lives even before birth, instill in parents a desire and commitment to bring the, their little children to Jesus. Use our Lutheran schools in the area, the colleges and all, along with all areas of children's ministries to preserve all of our children in the one true faith. Teach them, of, uh, teach each of us in humility to receive the kingdom of God like little children. Lord, in your mercy. You do not delight in the wickedness, dear Lord, or let the boastful stand before you. Give the leaders of the nations wisdom to govern in accordance with your will. Keep them mindful of the stewardship that they hold on behalf of others, that they will fulfill their duties with diligence and humility. We therefore pray for President Biden, uh, Vice President Harris, uh, the men and women in the House of Representatives, the men and women in the Senate, the Supreme Court Justices, Illinois Governor Pritzker, and Des Plaines Mayor Goskowski. Lord, in your mercy, pray for those serving our city in the various services, including the police, the fire department, the ambulance service, and all first responders. Grant these men and women the strength and stamina that they need each day as they are called to serve. Lord, in your mercy, we pray for our friends and our family members who are struggling with their health and well-being, uh, including uh, Deb Swanson, Ken Markworth, uh, Walter Krauss, Marlene Johnson, Irene Schutz, Kathleen Prophet, uh, Marion Wegner, Tony uh, and Renee Davison, Liliana O'Donnell, uh, Jack Shannon, Phil and Susan Schemke, Carol uh, Ludlow, um, Beth Cash, and Deb Graves. Continue to heal these folks, uh, strengthen them, uh, and uh, return them to full health according to your will and in your time. Lord, in your mercy, we are uh, uh, thanking and praising you for another year of life that you've granted to uh, those celebrating birthdays, including uh, uh, Barb Keir, uh, Wanda Cal uh, Kalis, and um, we praise and thank you, Lord, for that. We also pray and thank you, Lord, for anniversaries, for those celebrating anniversaries, for the many years you've granted them, including uh, Joanne and Raymond uh, Ertel, um, John and uh, Chris Descharm, uh, Ken and Marlene Johnson, and Ron and Marjorie Lindenberg. Thank you, Lord God, for the many years you have granted these folks of uh, their married life. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercies through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll continue.